Welcome to Purple Chats, a podcast brought to you by the Fuels Institute. Hey everybody, welcome back to Carpool Chats. I'm John Eichberg with the Fuels Institute, and today we're joined with by Mark Boyagis with IHS Market. Uh, Fuels Institute's Electric Vehicle Council reached out to IHS Market last year and contracted for them to do a research project for us. We said, look, you know, the uh, president has said we need half a million EV chartered by 2030. And what we asked Mark and his team to help us figure out is, okay, how many do we actually need? When do we need them? Where do we need them? And for different use case scenarios, what kind do we need? I think we need to be very strategic about our deployment and our allocation of resources. So Mark, thank you very much for joining us today on Carpool Chats. Yeah, thanks, John. Happy to be here. Excited. So why don't you give us, a, I think probably everybody in the audience knows who IHS Market is, but in case there's a few out there have not heard of you guys, can you kind of give us a quick rundown on the firm you represent? Sure. IHS Market is a, a global business information and, and market research firm. We, we serve um, industries uh, from energy to defense to chemical to agriculture to automotive and transportation um, and, and ECR. And, it, and it's, it's all kind of spanning around uh, business information and helping our customers understand what's going on in the marketplace um, from any sorts of trends that we might be talking about. And so I, I specialize in the automotive sector been here for 15 years covering vehicle technologies all that time. So the question we posed to you guys, very simple question, right? I mean, how many chargers do we need over the next 10 to 20 years? When do we need them? Where do we need them? Um, chat, tell me a little bit about how you guys kind of tackled this, because it's not a small question. It's a huge question. Yeah. And it gets, I mean, the, a lot of people like to simplify it, but it's we have to be much more thoughtful about this. So you guys took a very uh, detailed approach to this. Yeah, I, I laughed when you said it's a very simple question. <laughs> it, it is a very simple question, but it, it, to ask it the right way, you need to, to really dive into it. Um, so we, we kind of, we've been forecasting electric vehicles for a number of years now. And the thing that's really fascinating is whenever we're doing this kind of deep level forecasting, there's not a lot of history to draw from, right? Okay. Electric vehicles by and large are still uh, uh, newfound for most mainstream consumers. And and the, th the thing that we need to think about is how the infrastructure needs to ebb and flow alongside that growth. Um, and the infrastructure piece is so, so important. It's, it's the, the chicken for the egg or the egg for the chicken. I, 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 tend, to, I tend to say that the, the chicken came first, the car, you know, if you think back to when Tesla started creating its, its, its enterprise. Um, and then they built out the infrastructure, right? They built out those, those um, um, supercharger networks throughout. So when we took a look at how to answer this question of, of where will the charger growth be needed in, in the US, we had to think about how the industry is gonna grow over the next couple of years, where it's gonna grow and how it's gonna grow. Um, one thing that we recognized early on is to think about it from the federal line only is to sell it incredibly short. It's not nearly granular enough because um, the federal uh, representatives, the federal government is not actually putting charging stations in the ground. All they can do is invest, pull levers, incentivize, and empower lower levels of geography and communities to get involved, um, be it the states, the municipalities, the utilities, or even you know local retail owners and, and that sort of thing. Or, excuse me, real estate owners and that sort of thing. So. We took a very uh, bottom-up approach, um, matching with our top-down numbers uh, to, to kind of validate where the, the infrastructure needs are going to be. With that being said, the federal government has $7.5 billion they're looking to invest. And as you said, they're at the high level. They're looking at it from a national perspective. But we have to be a little more uh, specific about where that money is going because you're in Minneapolis. I'm in Virginia. Our demand for charging is going to be very different than from California, Florida, Washington, Oregon. Um, so how do we start figuring out how we can allocate the resources most effectively to build the infrastructure where it's most needed? Yeah. So that gets into the crux of the problem, right? You have um, a lopsided demand curve on, uh, on, on the, the U.S. market as a whole. It looks nice and neat and clean, and it's going to grow over time. But when you look at it on a uh, regional basis or a state by state basis, it gets quite lopsided quite quickly. Um, I don't need to tell most of, of the audience that California is going to be the highest demand state across the board. They already are. Um, they've got you know leadership in terms of 
uh, the, the sales volume um, and also in terms of the infrastructure. But, you know, to put some numbers to this, um, you know, we see that nationwide we're expecting um, uh, about 18 million EVs to be on the road by 2030, okay, in the U.S. alone. And to support this volume of vehicle, we estimate we need to have about 1.8 to 1.9 million chargers in the ground and in operation by that same time. 1.8, 1.9 million. That's a lot different than the 500,000 the federal government wants to put in. Right. Now, the 500,000 is kind of that that um, investment case, right? We believe that there needs to be a combination of level two and level three chargers that will really uh, you know, extend the, the infrastructure capabilities across the nation. Um, we know that there's been a heavy influence thus far on level two charging in urban and suburban areas and a, a, a pretty significant focus on level three charging in highway intersections uh, and highway interchange opportunities. So um, being able to understand how that's gonna be mapped out um, uh, nationwide is, is a really, really important thing to consider. We, I've already mentioned California stands alone as the top priority. They already have high volume expectations and their growth is gonna keep going. But what's really interesting is that just underneath California, we have kind of a level two priority of states like Texas, states like Florida, New York, and New Jersey. These are states that are going to have um, a rapid amount of expansion of, of these types of vehicles in the coming five to six years. Um, and their infrastructure is still kind of playing catch up. Um, in, in parts of Texas, we've seen the, the infrastructure build out in the last two years to be about 80 to 90 percent of its entire stock is less than two years old. Whereas in California, you already have a lot of charging stations that are being you know, pulled out of the ground to get um, replaced with new ones because they've been in operation for, for quite some time. So it's, it, it, you know, it comes down to that, that interplay between where the demand is needed today versus where it's going to be needed in the future. And that, I mean, that's really important. I mean, one of the things I saw when I was reading my early, earlier drafts of the report was like 15 states today represent like 85, 87% of all electric vehicles in the United States. Your forecast for 2030 is the 15 biggest states still going to represent like 75% of the fleet. And so as we, as the government's starting to look at how we build out a program to support growth I mean, we need to build stations where the vehicles are going to be operating. Mm-hmm. We need to have corridors. We need to, we need to enable long long driving and stuff like that. So that's a priority. But you guys really took a look at population densities and population demand curves and all that stuff mm-hmm. to kind of build out some idea of how many chargers we're going to need in different markets. Can you kind of walk us through a little bit of those findings? Sure. So, yeah, that comes down to our ratio of chargers per car. Um, and when you look at the different states, some of the lopsidedness is kind of natural. It's due to population density, right? Um, the, the North Central United States will, will not soon or ever have the same amount of population as the East Coast or the West Coast, right? So that is kind of a natural tendency of, of the distribution itself. But when you get into the, the level of, of infrastructure compared to the level of demand, um, it's not always those expected states with high population that, that we're going to see that, that growth. So I already mentioned California, Florida, Texas. These are areas where we have um, a pretty significant ratio of plug-in um, uh, vehicles to, uh, to public chargers. And the aim is to try and get as close to that 10 to 15 vehicles to charger number. Um, That number is kind of an internationally recognized um, line for defining whether or not an infrastructure is congested or not, okay? If you have too many cars and too few chargers, your your infrastructure is congested and and there's a consumer issue, right? You just can't find access to charging for, for public needs. If you have too few cars and too much infrastructure, then you have another issue where there's a question of, well, why did we spend all this money for infrastructure that's not getting used? So um, in different parts of the country, we have these different numbers. In California, we expect the ratio um, in total, this is combined level two and level three, at uh, 23 uh, to 24 vehicles per public charger today. Um, in New Jersey and Arizona, we're also you know well beyond that, that um, 
that, that threshold of, of number of vehicles per charger. So there's a need to, to have that growth in those marketplaces. Um, some states that are a little closer to that, that happy medium is Massachusetts is only at about 11. Colorado is at 12. Um, New York, while it today it's at 11.6 to 12, we're expecting that to grow pretty significantly. Um, and it's all kind of comes together as to looking at the different population trends and the demographics of the market. Um, one thing I do want to add into this that, that was a really important aspect of our methodology was to look at vehicle mobility trends, right? When traditionally IHS market is doing a lot of its automotive reporting, we, we talk about registration. That's where people is, have registered the vehicles, essentially where they live. Um, but we realize for infrastructure needs, it's not where you live, it's where you're going to drive it. Um, okay. And, you know, for that exact example, we saw, you know, the um, interplay between New York and New Jersey is, is quite interesting. New Yorkers, um, you know, were driving um, a, a, a significant degree and they still need to have this kind of access to charging. But there was a lot more in New Jersey, people going over the Hudson trying to get into uh, Manhattan for, for work and those kind of things. Uh, it, it, it presented a, an opportunity where there's going to be a, a need for charging more on the New Jersey side, right? Because that's where people are going to be driving from. And so, you know, in each metro area, whether it's Miami, or whether it's LA and San Francisco or New York uh, metro, you need to be considering some of the nuances of uh, uh, where people are coming from, where their cars are going to be, how long they're going to be driving, what kind of driving conditions they're going to be in, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, and that's what it comes down to is there's no simple we need X number. The other element that I think it's kind of gets lost sometimes in the in the national and global discussion is what type of chargers do we need? You mentioned a lot of level two. We're going to need some DC fast chargers. What speed, what power of DC fast chargers? You've got some vehicles coming on that can absorb a 350 kilowatt. <laughs> yeah. Right now there's one. Right now there's one. The anticipation is that number is going to grow, but 350 kilowatt charging station is much more expensive than a 100 kilowatt charging station mm -hmm. and much more expensive than level two. So how do we start right sizing the deployment to get the best bang for our buck to make sure we're servicing the customers with what they need, but not wasting money or building assets are going to sit there unutilized and just sucking in capital? Yeah, it's another fundamental, like foundational mm -hmm. question that we need to have answered and you can't answer it from the top down. You have to be thinking about this from the ground up and regionalizing uh, uh, and contextualizing the answer because what happens and what's needed in New York is different what, than what's gonna be happening and, and needed in Houston. Um, and you know, considering those, those constraints, we need to think about how we're gonna leverage a level two technology or a variety of level three levels of, 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 of speed and technology. So what I think is, and I'm going to be candid here. I think I think opinions are starting to shift on DC fast charge. Um, okay. L2 L2 is by and large the the most effective way to provide public charging. Excuse me, the most cost effective way to provide public okay. charging. It might not always be the most effective way. Um, and so as we look at the the demand, you know, yeah, we've got these cars that are going to have 300 ish mile range um there's more than one now that that can uh, receive 350 kilowatts or better um <laughs> i mean every day right but consumer electronics show this week has, has shown there's been there's been a um expansion on that but the point i'm making is is it needed to have a bunch of 350 watt <laughs> kilowatt chargers out there no a lot of money no that's a lot of money that's it's a lot of real estate you know yeah. Buying the chargers alone is going to cost a lot of money, but installing them is going to be even more because you need to put in transformers, you need to adapt the electricity grid, you need to have certain thresholds with how far away the transformers are to the charging stations and all this. Um, so I think ideally what we're going to see the market evolve from is the 6 to 12 kilowatt level 2 chargers that are I would say commoditized today. They're they're pretty widely distributed and easy to find, and usually pretty low cost if not free. To a a a, a lower speed DC fast charge. Um, to to be candid, I believe that that 50 kilowatt range is maybe like the Goldilocks zone. 
um, because when you go into 150 kilowatt and, and 350 kilowatt, first of all, you might not have cars that can even receive that much. Um, and secondly, you know, it's really cost prohibitive to put some of that stuff in. Whereas the level two charging, depending upon who you ask, that could also be useless. I mean, if you have a lucid air charging on a 6.6 .6 kilowatt level two charger, that's still going to take you over a day. So right. um, how do we find that happy medium? Well, there's there's 50 to 100 kilowatt you know, DC fast chargers in that Goldilocks zone that are relatively inexpensive, don't require as much infrastructure to install, and, and could provide that nice happy medium between on-demand charging um, for, for quick access and, and quick refills or relatively quick refills, as well as the, you know, three to four hour dwell times that people are going to be experiencing when they just charge where they park. Right. You know, it's, it's so interesting because I talk to a lot of people about this and I've got some out there saying level two is, is the bread and butter. We need a bunch of level yeah. two. I've got others saying, man, anything under 150 kilowatt <laughs> is just a waste of money. Those 50 kill they're, they're dinosaurs. We're never going to, they're useless. But the difference is you're taking the approach the same way I am, because I, I agree with you. You have to look at the site, the use case scenario, the consumer travel patterns. What do they need? Mm -hmm. Not everybody needs to get 70 miles in 15 minutes. Some people just need to pick up 10 to 15 miles in 10, 15 minutes or even more yeah. is there's so many different use cases. Maybe if you're on a highway, long commute, long cross country, you need that higher power to get people back on the road. But if you're in a small community where people drive 20, 30 miles a day, maybe you don't need that. Maybe the 50 kilowatt makes sense. And the 50 kilowatt is going to cost you less to get into it. It's going to cost you less to operate it. It's going to give you an ROI on that investment a lot faster than that 350 kilowatt would. So, I mean, I, I love this approach. The bottom-up approach is how we're going to optimize the use of money, is how we're going to build an infrastructure that actually benefits the site host and the consumer in the most efficient way. And we need to have a lot more discussions like this because <clears throat> I get laughed out of conversations a lot when I start talking about 50 kilowatt chargers. And it's like, well, you know, in certain cases, maybe that's all you need. And why waste the money if you don't need to? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I tend to agree with that. There's, there's one other caveat to think about is, is the business model. Um, and it comes down to what is the use case of putting a charger here, right? And to your point, if we're talking about highway, long haul interchange type of uh, scenarios, yeah, they're going to need to recharge as fast as possible. Um, they're going to be able to charge money for those uh, electrons. Um, and then ultimately, that's going to benefit the consumers so that they can continue on with their drive. But in day in, day out, business as usual, electric vehicle ownership, um, you know, we need to think about how the United States is a predominantly single family ownership type of housing model. And these, you know, 80, 75 to 80 percent of people are still preferring to charge at home or at the workplace if they have access to workplace charging. And, and this isn't going to change, right? Now, if you think about the, the European Union, or if you think about Tokyo, or you think about other regions of the world, it's vastly different constraints to think about and vastly different um, housing mix and travel patterns, all these other things. But we're talking about the US today. And in the US here, you know, we have a, a highly um, dedicated you know, single family home ownership perspective. So I think that that's why there's a lot of pushback against lots of level two, because a lot of people have level two in their garage. Um, right. But not everyone will have access to a garage. You look at where the automakers want to go next. It's it's not Tesla owners with three car garages. It's people in multifamily housing. It's people in urban settings that have apartments that don't have garages, or if they have a garage, doesn't have access to a charging station overnight or any sort of even 120 outlet. Um, and so, how do you equip? the the infrastructure to feed the the the, the tidal wave of, of cars that we're going right. to see coming from the automakers um beyond just the single family homeowners so and i, I think, think that's you a, know i think we are going to if the market's going to grow and your your forecast of 18 million vehicles by 2030 is pretty small in my opinion compared to what we're hearing from the from the news and hype i think it's i think it's realistic i just think it's going to shock people say well you mean that's less than 10 percent 
yeah, but there's a big market. It's got to turn over. It's going to take time. But if we're going to get to a market where EVs are a significant portion of the fleet, which most people think we're going to, it's going to be populated, not just single family homeowners, just going to be other people in multi-unit dwellings who don't have assets charging, as you mentioned. And so citing our public charging stations where cars are stationary for prolonged periods of time is important mm -hmm. because if you're in an apartment, but you need to charge, if there's a charging station across the street, maybe you're going to park there for us. You guys actually took a look at where cars and people stay for a while to start identifying how do you optimize charging locations? You guys, I think you're looking at cell phone usage, right? Correct. Yeah. We're using mobility data, aggregated mobility data that was anonymized, of course. And what we were able to do is understand, I didn't even care whether or not this was an ICE vehicle or an electric car. I wanted to know where, where people were parking during the daytime right. because this is outside of your home, but you're going somewhere for one to four to five hours, right? And you know, you look at any metro area, Detroit, Houston, Portland, Oregon, you can identify zones where there's parking hotspots. And so then naturally you start to think, well, in five years, those parking hotspots will be, will have a higher percentage of electric cars in them because of the growth mm -hmm. in electric VIO or vehicles in operation. So let's put the charging stations, you know, the public access charging stations in those urban dense areas where those people are going to be parking. Because, you know, I don't expect the Detroit Metro airport to move anytime soon. So we can put charging <laughs> stations there. Right. And that's a that's right. a great opportunity. That's a little bit more of a an extended stay type of parking situation. But you also see shopping centers, retail outlets, um, event centers. Frankly, I'm an avid golfer. I don't know why every single golf course I'm always there for two and a half to four hours. Why don't they all have charging right. stations? You know, this is something that I, I think as the infrastructure develops, you'll start to see them more intelligently positioned around the parking demand because it's not where people are, are, are necessarily driving nor where they're registered. It's where they're <clears throat> parking for an extended period of right. time. That's where level two and even um, low speed DC fast charging is, is really going to be powerful. Your mention of golf course makes a lot more sense. I poke at some people quite often. They start talking about where we need to build chargers. And I keep hearing, you know, public libraries. And I start laughing. I'm all, who goes to public libraries anymore? And, and <laughs> you if know, you do, everybody's reading online. And if you do, you're 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 dropping off books and picking up new ones. I mean, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but you're not spending three to four hours there necessarily. Maybe if you're a student, I don't. <laughs> when I was a kid playing Dungeons and Dragons, we meet up at the at the library and play there. But you know, that's it's a different era and different time. So, um, yeah, the study we got the uh, draft coming to us this week. We're going to get into peer review next week. We're talking right now towards the middle of, of January. Uh, the plan is we hope to get it out in the market in Q1. We're going to expedite the review as po as quick as possible. But it's fantastic, and you know, I think you guys did a, an outstanding job, and I really appreciate the work and the. The approach you took to it, because you're right, you took the ground up approach, which I think is going to be so helpful to our government agencies, at the state and federal level, as they start developing programs to site host and EVSC providers and EV manufacturers, just to get their arms around what does a realistic build out look like yeah. that is going to serve the needs of the drivers, not the needs of politicians, not the needs of headlines, but serve the needs of drivers in the most efficient way possible. I think you guys did an outstanding job. Oh, well, I appreciate that, John. It, uh, it was a really interesting um, kind of expedition in how we can use our data in a different way and what unique inputs, like I mentioned, the mobility data and the housing mix and these other mm -hmm. aspects, um, you know, answering the question of what is really an important input to think about when, when you're forecasting charging. So, so Mark, thank you. Um, if people want to learn more about IHS Market, how can they learn more about the firm? Well, um, obviously, go to the website, ihsmarket.com. Um, over the next couple of Weeks, days, months, that's going to be evolving into S&P Global, um, but that's that's for another story at another time. But yeah, um, reach out uh, to me on LinkedIn. Um, you can you can find me there as well. Um, but uh, but obviously, IHSmarket.com is a good landing page for all of our different research and insights. And to you guys out there, when you're typing it in, be careful because AutoCorrect always wants to change it to HIS. Yes, so his market. that's true. So that's make true. sure you, the Microsoft you Office is a, is a, well, that, that'll be going away soon enough as the brand transitions, right. but yes. <laughs> All right, Mark, thank you very much for the work on the project. Thank you for joining us Carpool Chats. And everybody out there, stay tuned. We will be making a lot of noise when this project is ready for you guys to read. 
and uh, stay tuned. We're going to be teasing out a whole bunch of stuff over the next couple uh, weeks and months. So thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you on the next episode of Heartful Jacks.